want to be good hosts of his presence. And so, Father, we want to bow down low before you and give you every bit of reverence that you deserve tonight.
series, Revive Us. Um, not surprisingly, a series I'm pretty excited about. Um, and we are studying every revival in the Bible in this series. We have looked at the Joshua and Caleb generation. 
revival. We've looked at Samuel's revival. We've looked at the revival uh, during David's reign. Fourth is this revival under Asa. This is going to be Second Chronicles chapters 14 to 16 is where this uh, narrative is found, or at least in its fullest form. And so if you have your Bibles with you uh, digitally or paper, uh, go ahead and turn there to Second Chronicles uh, 14-ish. A uh, very famous verse that you'll be familiar with comes out of this section of Chronicles, uh, one that uh, I feel like gripped my heart as a teenager, and I am praying would grip all of our hearts, uh, no matter what age we are, again and again and again, and it's Second Chronicles 16, 9, that the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he might show himself strong to those whose heart is completely his. May we be a people for whom the eyes of God can stop searching and can stop and settle upon us. Amen. Now that word moving to and fro, it's, uh, it can also just mean running to and fro. And just think about the eyes of God doing that. Like what does God do all day? Well, certainly beyond our wildest imagination, uh, but among the long list of things that God does every single day, we're told that he seeks, that he searches, and he's searching for something that he prizes, something that he counts as priceless. And it's a heart that is fully his. If only we knew how much the heart of God can be moved by his sons and daughters, wholly devoting themselves to him. A heart that is seeking him, his eyes stop. Our seeking wholeheartedly leads to God stopping totally in his search. Now, we hear that God's eyes stop on the one who's seeking. And I kind of think that we might imagine that that's a pretty frequent thing. Like God's eyes like sprint, stop, sprint, stop, sprint, stop, you know, like every few feet across the earth or across the globe or something. Um, but the scripture that we just read said that his eyes travel to and fro, like across the globe. A few weeks ago, we looked, looked at this word seek in scripture and we found that God frequently tells us to do this, to seek him. And he usually partners it with a promise, you know, if the, that if we'll seek him uh, with all our hearts, that we will find him, or that if we will seek him, he'll heal our land, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not all that we found about this word seek. We found that it's rarely used to describe people actually doing it. <laughs> it's like all this words from God telling us to seek him, but it's very rare to actually find a description of people in the Bible seeking him. God. Very rare. Uh, this is a new discovery for me. I actually had to wade through hundreds of uses of this word, uh, seek, to see this. It's just so rare to see this word seek used to describe humans seeking God. Seeking lots of things. It's a very common word. But actually seeking God, extremely rare. And whenever it happens, it's a thing of consequence. In fact, I didn't know this before we scheduled this series. I already had all the revivals of the Bible kind of laid out, prepared for it. And when I saw this, I saw that every time someone is actually described as seeking God, one of these revivals that we're about to study happened. Wow. Which tells us that God is faithful to his promise, that if we will seek him, he will revive us. It also tells us it's pretty rare to find. It's not all we found about this word seek, though. We did find one more thing. You'll probably remember this if you were here uh, as we talked about it. Of those few times that people seek God, there's only one single time that we read of someone seeking God's face. Just one time in all the scripture. Someone described as seeking the face of God. When God was sought for what he could do, even then... God responded. When God was sought for his hand, even then in the Bible, God responds. Even somebody just acknowledging, God, I need you, and acknowledging that he is a God who is capable of meeting their need and that he would respond to being sought. Even then, when he was sought for his hand, God still responded mightily and still responded powerfully. We're going to be studying one of those today. But there was this one time, just once, when we read that someone actually sought the face of God, which biblically is the presence of God. There's one time... Who was that? It was David. The same David who wrote in Psalm 24, 3 to 6, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, 
who doesn't trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. I mean, David dreamed of a generation who would be after the heart of God. David was dreaming of a generation who would be willing to put their crampons on if necessary to step higher up the mountain of more of God. David dreamed of a generation who'd be willing to swing with force the ice axe if needed to reach higher for more of God. David dreamed of a generation who would cleanse their hands from sin and purify their hearts before him in order to ascend the mountain of more of the presence of God. He dreamed of a generation who would seek God, who would seek his face. And yet little did David know that that phrase would only ever be described of one, and it wouldn't be a generation, it would be an individual, him. And yet, this dream is alive today. What if there was a generation who would seek, seek his face? What if it was this? Generation. This is where we say, yes, God, let us start with me. Amen. We want to be a generation who seeks. There's one that God's eyes rest on. Are you that one? Do you want to be that one? It is possible to be that one. And he will show himself strong on your behalf as he promised. Now, one of the places we see people seeking God in the Bible, and we see this ending up being met with a sustained revival. It's under King Asa. King Asa, 2 Chronicles 14 says, Asa commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and the commandment. 2 Chronicles 14, 7, for he said to Judah, the land is still ours because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him and he has given us rest on every side. How interesting that he leads the people to seek and then there is peace in the land in 2 Chronicles 14, 7. Just in verse 7, literally it's the fulfillment of Second Chronicles 7, 14 and 14, 7. As they are seeking God, he's bringing peace to the land. Anyways, I thought that was cool. Clearly no one else does, but nevertheless. Second Chronicles 15, 12. They entered into the covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and their soul. Second Chronicles 15, 15. All Judah rejoiced concerning the oath, for they had sworn with their whole heart, and they had sought him earnestly, and he let them find him. Now, there's a whole lot of seeking in this revival, maybe the most that we see in Scripture. And following the seeking of chapter 15, there ends up being this sustained revival that lasts about two and a half decades. And it's really a setup to the ending of a great story, an ending that ends up coming in Second Chronicles 16. Second Chronicles 16, 12 says, In the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet. His disease was severe, yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. Dang it. Gosh, man, you were so close, Asa. Like, how does a guy who sought the Lord at the beginning of his reign, and then he seeks the Lord in the middle of his reign, which leads to a true, genuine, lasting revival, how does he end his life this way? We read about a man who was seeking, we read about him seeking, 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 and then he stopped seeking. And a nation that was seeking and seeking and seeking, and then they stopped seeking. Now, what stopped them from seeking? We're going to dissect both the good and the bad today. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather end with the good. So bad news first. Let's just be sure we understand why their seeking stopped. What caused their seeking to stop? It's the same thing that threatens us today. Every single one of us today is something that could be called seasonal Christianity. Seasonal Christianity is the threat to seeking Christianity. Now, if we read between the lines of this passage, we can see all the signs of seasonal Christianity that's lurking in the shadows. And it eventually lurches right into the light. But nevertheless, is this lurking in the shadows of our lives too? We're going to look at four signs of seasonal Christianity that we see 
in this text. Uh, first, to get started, let's read about the inciting incident of the revival. Okay, Second Chronicles 15 is what leads to this revival. It's a prophetic word that's going to be delivered to King Asa. Okay, so we'll read it in verse 1 to 7 of Second Chronicles 15. Now the Spirit of God came on Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa. And he said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. And if you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For many days Israel was without the true God and without a teaching priest and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord God of Israel and they sought him and he let them find him. In those times, there was no peace to him who went out or to him who came near for many disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the land. Nation was crushed by nation, city by city, for God troubled them with every kind of distress. But you be strong and do not lose courage for there is reward for your work. Now Asa hears this, and then what does he do? He responds humbly, and he responds with seeking God. And we see this revival come. And we're going to get to that here in a moment. But first, what is so interesting about this is that this prophetic word, which was a prophetic warning, comes when? In what context is this word being given? We're going to read the context in the verses right before, which is the very end of chapter 14, verse 9 to 14. Now, Zerah the Ethiopian came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. And he came to Merishah, and Asa went out to meet him, and they drew up in battle formation in the valley of Zephatha at Merishah. Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one besides you to help in the battle between the powerful and those who have no strength. So help us, O Lord our God, for we trust in you and in your name have come against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Let no man prevail against you. And so the Lord routed, rooted the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah. And the Ethiopians fled. Asa and the people who were with him pursued them as far as Gerar. So many Ethiopians fell, they couldn't recover, for they were shattered before the Lord and before his army. And they carried away very much plunder. They destroyed all the cities around Gerar, for the dread of the Lord had fallen on them, and they despoiled all the cities, for there was much plunder in them. They also struck down those who owned livestock. They carried away large numbers of sheep and camels, and then they returned to Jerusalem. And then the next verse is this prophetic warning. So the prophetic warning comes when? Right after the when. This prophetic warning comes right after the win, which tells you what? That after a victory, you are at greatest risk for defeat. Sorry to be a buzzkill, but at, right after victory, you are at a greatest risk for defeat. This warning, it comes right after the win because God knows that in a time of victory, they're most likely to forsake God, abandon seeking, and go to sit back and to relax. And so he tells them, 2 Chronicles 15, 7, but you be strong and do not lose courage for there is reward for your work. Literally in the Hebrew, it's saying, be strong and do not relax for you will be rewarded for your Work, And this is getting after the first sign of seasonal Christianity. It seeks God when, but only when. Seasonal Christianity seeks God when, but only when. It's circumstantial. It's not sustained. It will, it will seek steadfastly when it is in need, but when it wins, it's in danger of resting, turning into relaxing. Instead of working, this is usually missed in Asa because so often when Asa is read, it's portrayed as if Asa starts off strong and then he continues strong in the middle and then he meets that threat of a million man army with reliance upon the Lord and then bam, random wham, this prophetic word and this warning is given and it just kind of appears like a buzzkill. You know, it's like, imagine Asa being like, wow, bro, can you just give me a minute to pop the champagne? You know, I mean, we just. We just won. Like, why are you correcting my, me right now? Shouldn't I be commended right now? You know, it just makes no sense. And if we read it like that, it actually doesn't make much sense. But that's actually not what happened. Let's look closer. Back to Asa's response to the prophetic warning in verse 8 of Second Chronicles 15. It says, when Asa heard these words and the prophecy which Azariah the son of Oded, the prophet, spoke, he took courage... 
And he removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had captured in the hill country of Ephraim. He then restored the altar of the Lord, which is in front of the porch of the Lord. So here's the thing. We're seeing a lot of good, and we're going to come back to this, but right now we're catching the shadows of seasonal Christianity that, uh, that's lurking, okay? He removes all the idols from the land. That sounds very awesome and spot on until we consider that at the very beginning is, of his reign, we read back in Second Chronicles chapter 14, verse 2, about the first 10 years of his life that preceded this battle with the million-man army. It says in Second Chronicles 14, verse 2, Asa did good and right in the sight of the Lord. He removed the foreign altars, the high places. He tore down the sacred pillars. He cut down the Asherim. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and the commandment. He also removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah, and the kingdom was undisturbed under him. So here's the thing. Whenever he, after this prophetic warning, starts to remove the idols and calls everyone to seek God and to observe God's laws, okay, this is what he did at the beginning. We're seeing him do it again later. But this is interesting because 10 years later, he's now redoing the work that he did years before, right? You're catching this. Which tells us that he allowed the idols that he tore down at the beginning to be re-erected during that decade. And simultaneously, 10 years later, we hear that he is restoring the altar of the Lord. That's bad. Okay. I mean, 10 years ago, there was the seeking of God, removing of the, the idols and a keeping of God's laws. But you talk about seasonal. Oh, it was so seasonal. It was met by peace from all of their enemies. And then during that time, Asa ordered the people to go and fortify the cities and put walls and gates and bars up around all of them. And during that season of fortifying, they were also running around and re-erecting all the sacrificial high places of the abominable idols. All right. While simultaneously they're, they're they're putting back all the high places of all the idols while simultaneously neglecting sacrifices to god himself so much so the altar of god's not even operational anymore when you read he repaired the altar of the lord that's like saying today there was a reform and the doors of the church were opened again opened again in other words, there was not a sustained seeking from the beginning of Asa's life all the way through the middle of Asa's reign. There was seeking, and then there was peace, and then there was no seeking, but there was forsaking. And then there was no peace again, and so then there was seeking again. This is the first sign of seasonal Christianity. It draws near when. Second, seasonal Christianity draws near four. Go back to the start of Asa's reign, Second Chronicles 14, 1. So Abijah slept with his fathers. They buried him in the city of David. His son, Asa, became king in his place. The land was undisturbed for 10 years during his days. Verse 2, uh, Asa did good and right in the sight of the Lord. He removed the foreign altars. He removed the high places. He tore down the sacred pillars. He cut down the Esherim. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and observe the commandment. Verse 5, he also removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah. The kingdom was undisturbed under him. Next verse, verse 6, he built fortified cities in Judah since the land was undisturbed. And there was no one at war with him during those years because the Lord had given him rest. Verse 7, so he said to Judah, let us build these cities and surround them with walls and towers, gates and bars. The land is still ours because we've sought the Lord our God. We have sought him and he's given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. Now, does anything seem maybe a little odd about this? It's like, hey, we sought God and then God gave us peace. So now let's go build some fortified cities. Anything seem a little odd about it? It's like, woo God came through, and I never want to be in a place where I need him to come through again. Another way to say it's, woo God came through, so now let's do what we need to do so we do not need him to come through. There's so many people who encounter a testimony. Think about this. They encounter a testimony of God acting on their behalf, and it kind of becomes a one-off thing. 
It's just something that ends up in the recesses of their history. It never actually impacts the rest of their life, even though God clearly did this thing. And the reason why is because they don't see beyond what God did to who God is. He healed. He healed that time. If that doesn't go higher, to, he is the healer. If God's a healer, I bet he's going to act out of who he is. He's going to do it again. Or he provided. If it doesn't go beyond, he provided that time. So cool. Thanks. Thanks, God. To he is my provider. And he'll provide over and over again. Or his power was displayed. If it doesn't go beyond like, whoo, I saw God's power one time. To he is powerful. And God does out of who he is. He's powerful. He is power. He will do powerful things. I mean, God gave them peace. Instead of using the peace for praise, they used the peace to fortify to build defenses of self-reliance. Do you know that we have the power to pervert a blessing and turn it into a curse? God can bless you and you can turn it into a curse. This morning I was listening to a pastor talk about the prodigal son parable, how the son took the blessings of the father and he took the produce from the father's hands and then he used it to finance a plane ticket away from the presence of his father, away from the face of his father. Happens so often. God provides, he prospers, he protects. He gives us a season of peace. Instead of taking that opportunity to seek and to draw near, we take it and we forsake him. The blessing gets turned into a curse. But that prodigal, whenever he came to his senses, he recognized that every need and blessing was in his father's house. And so he came back and he didn't feel they had to come back with any kind of authority or status or anything like that. No, no, no. He said, I'll come back as a slave just to be in my father's house. Those who know the presence of God, listen, they don't actually want anything other than the presence of God. Those who truly know the presence of God, they're not looking for anything else. Those who want the hand of God, they'll seek. And then when God gives, they'll use what God gave to actually forsake instead of seek. Because they already got what they needed. Whatever he gave. Think of the Israelites walking out of Egypt. And what did God do? He, pl- he, had the Egypt- he plundered the Egyptians. He had, literally had the Egyptians just give them all their stuff. Like, how'd that work? They just gave all their gold, right? Their gold necklaces and earrings and all this stuff, right? So they just walk out of Egypt covered in gold. Like God's just showering his love upon his people in this way. And then they took the gold and what'd they do with it? Yeah. They fashioned it into another. So God's love for them was not met by love from them. They made another God and they returned God's love to them Not with seeking, but with forsaking. Pouring their love and their energy and their affection, their time, their money, etc. Out not on him, but out on another. What would we do? What would you do if you were crisis free and you had everything that you needed? What would you do with all that? Do most people seek God then? Let's be honest. Would we seek God then? There's a test in the valley, right? We understand, like, there's a test in the valley. There's a test in these hard times. But there is a test at the mountaintop, too. Like, how hungry, how desperate are you when, when things are well? If we see that in us, it would be a sign of seasonal Christianity, that it may not be a stranger to us. Third sign of seasonal Christianity that's lurking in the shadows of this story. In verse 7, the prophetic challenge uh, of get, was given of Second Chronicles, I actually think the chapter might be wrong there. I think it might be 15. Yeah, because he says, but you be strong and do not lose courage for there is reward for your work. So Asa gets to work right away. He starts to remove the idols. He restores the altar. We'll read the rest uh, at the end of this message, but in short, revival follows. And as part of that, we read in 2 Chronicles 15, 18, that he brought into the house of God the dedicated things of his father and his own dedicated things, silver and gold and utensils. And so he's got some dedicated things to the Lord, and the things dedicated he's putting into the house of the Lord. And then later, whenever war is threatened again, Look at what he does. 
So war is threatened again. This is years after the Million Man Army thing and the revival and all that. Second Chronicles 16, verse 1. In the 36th year of Asa's reign, Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and fortified Ramah in order to prevent anyone from going out or coming into Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa brought out silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the king's house, and he sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, who lived in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me, as between my father and your father. Behold, I have set, sent you silver and gold. Go break your treaty with Bastard, king of Israel, so that he'll withdraw from me. Did you catch that? The very things he dedicated and his father dedicated that he put into the house of the Lord, he took them back out of the house of the Lord, and he gives them to somebody else. Oh. Seasonal Christianity in some form or another will always do this. It will tend to make commitments to God and it will backtrack because it's conditional in nature. It backtracks on commitments made to God because its own commitments are based on an if. Even though the if's probably not stated, it's like, God, I'm going to give you this thing as long as. I'll do this as long as. So imagine Ace's heart. He's like, God, I'll, yeah, I'll give you all this as long as you keep me safe. As long as you give me security, we can see that security is certainly an idol taking place in Asa's heart. But Israel, they're fortifying a border city. And that's scary. God, what I gave you sacrificially to you before, I'm now going to take back. I'm going to give it to this really powerful king next door. Conditional Christianity, it doesn't give to God so much as it loans to him. If you, then I. Otherwise, I'll backtrack on it. A way to recognize if this is in us is if we make commitments with him and then when it gets hard, if we stop. Or if we pray, we say, if you this, then I'll this. That's a good way to recognize this. If we hang our obedience as a carrot in front of God, imagining that we are baiting him, that we are tempting him to goodness, we've got to understand that our conditional surrender shows our condition. Seasonal Christianity. Fourth final sign of seasonal Christianity. Pay attention. Why does Asa respond so well to the prophetic correction that came 10 years into his reign right after the battle with the Ethiopians? But why does he not respond well to the prophetic correction at the very end of his reign, at the very end of his life? Pay close attention. The first one, God said through the prophet, if you will, I will. If you do not, then I will not. Second Chronicles 15, 2. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he'll be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Also that first one, 10 years in, Second Chronicles 15, 7. Uh, the prophet passed along. Be strong, do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. So there's a big if being delivered to Asa here, right? It's like to Asa's credit, he hears this and he sees this if, and he actually believes God. And he responds with great motivation to all of this, to this if. Most miss the if, and so therefore they miss inheriting the promises of God. So 10 paths on the back for Asa for recognizing the if and responding so diligently in this prophetic word. It leads to revival, a very incredible one. But the second prophetic correction for Asa, which comes at the end of his life, it did not contain an if. Instead, at the end of verse 9, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, prophet speaking to him, from now on, you will surely have wars. This time, instead of a warning and an if and blessing and peace, if he just gets told from now on, you surely will have wars. So what does Asa do? 2 Chronicles 16, 10, then Asa was angry. He was angry with the seer and he put him in prison for he was enraged at him. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. Wow. So in short, Asa rejected the word of prophecy when it came with no immediate incentive for him. Those who seek God might be out to seek his hand, but not his face. And if so, and so if seeking won't be met by what they want from his hand, they stop seeking him. The moment they think God's not going to give me what I want, they just stop seeking him. Contrast that to David. He's one who sought God's face. Whenever God told David that the baby would die, David sought God. Whenever God told David a plague was going to come due to his taking of the census, still David sought God. There was no if. 
he still sought God. He was after God. He was seeking. It wasn't seasonal. Now, what's the opposite and the antithesis of this kind of seasonal Christianity? It is a seeking Christianity. It has sustained seeking. It has genuine speaking. By the way, I like to say that this is a seeker-sensitive church. Not in the traditional sense, but this church will always be sensitive to those who are seeking. Sensitive to those who are hungriest, sensitive to those who are thirstiest, sensitive to those that are desperate for more of God, that are drawing near to God. Sensitive to those who are seeking. We're very seeker sensitive. And regardless of where someone is on their journey, if they're seeking, we're sensitive. Now, if someone is stagnant, we're not sensitive. If someone's lukewarm, I'm insensitive. If someone wants to harbor doubt or unbelief or disinterest or casual Christianity or lukewarm love in the house of God, our goal is to make this place feel extremely uncomfortable. That's the goal. If someone wants to mix costly Christianity in with pursuits of idols of significance or prominence or power or prestige or comfort or whatever, our goal is for this to be extremely uncomfortable to hang out in that place. We're after him. And so we're out to remove all that stands between us and him. In other words, we're a seeker-sensitive church. Of course, if you know the traditional meaning of that term, we describe it in the completely opposite way of how it's usually talked about. But here's the thing. Ace's revival is marked by seeking. And it was a profound seeking. I mean, it leads to what appears to be a two-and-a-half-decade season of revival accompanied with this profound peace from the Lord. Let's go back to it again, Second Chronicles 15 eight. When Asa heard these words in the prophecy which Azariah, the son of Oded, the prophet, spoke, he took courage. This is the first thing we see about seeking is it's just responsive to God speaking. Seeking is responsive to God speaking to God's word, to God's spirit. It's not slow. It's not sluggish. Seeking Christianity has a swiftness to it. Not like it hears and then it delays. No, it hears, it does. When we're seeking the face of God, we're very responsive to God's word. When we're seeking God, we're just not okay to make God wait. We're not okay to send him the message that anything else is a priority. And we see that with Asa. He heard and he did, and there was no delay. I shared on the opening night of this series uh, about the revival. There has been a number, but one of the big revivals in Argentina. And it, it started like the spirit broke at this moment at a prayer meeting when this woman came up and knocked on the table in the middle of the room of the prayer meeting. Night after night after night, God had been telling her to knock on the table. She refused to do it because she didn't understand it and she didn't want to look silly in front of the people. Um, and so she just didn't do it. And then finally she did. Revival broke and a nation was changed. Some of us think that having God wait on us for obedience is not a big deal. Some of us have kind of sized up the thing that God's telling us to do as being relatively insignificant in the grand scheme of things. Like, God, I know you told me that, but it seems like a small thing. Listen, we think we're waiting on God. What if God's waiting on us? Ever thought about this? What if you're that woman? What if God's waiting on you for that act of obedience that ushers in revival? Seeking is responsive to God, speaking in his word and by his spirit. Church, one of the things that I pray for is that this would be a church that is responsive to the word of God. Just responsive to the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It doesn't say that the word of God's a butter knife. It says the word of God's sharper than any two-edged sword. Which means that if there is any dullness whenever the word of God is opened, it's not in God's word, it's in us. Have any of us arrived at the point that we have attained all? Have any of us reached such a point of perfection that there's nothing to be pierced in me anymore? Have we been so sharpened that we can grow no sharper by the perfect sword of God's word? How is this word so sharp that it could separate joint and marrow, but it can't pierce and show and separate us from the sin that's within? We're so easily pierced by the words of the enemy. The enemy speaks and we believe. Oh, the enemy speaks and we fear. The enemy whispers, we scatter. 
Church, let's be a church that has soft hearts that respond with swift obedience, not to what the enemy speaks, but to the word of God. That we might hear of the fear of the Lord and he would be met by the fear of the Lord. When we hear the holiness of the Lord, he's met with repentance. That when we would hear, we would respond to him. Let's be a seeking church. That's part of being a seeking church. Seeking church. Second, Second Chronicles 15, 8. When Asa heard these words and the prophecy which Azariah, the son of Oda, the prophet, spoke, he took courage and he removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had captured in the hill country of Ephraim. He then restored the altar of the Lord, which is in front of the porch of the Lord. So, like, what are we seeing in a seeking Christianity? We will see a hatred of sin in a seeking Christianity. And it's not just like a hatred of his sin or hatred of her sin. No, it's powerfully personalized. It like, it hates my own sin. It hates my sin. It's own sin. It will make no exceptions. Second Chronicles 15, 16 tells us he dethroned his own mom because of her sin. That's a seeking Christianity. It makes no exceptions. It won't hold anything as dear, sacred, special, or off limits. It will give all and it will give up all in devotion to him. If anyone thinks they love God and don't hate sin, they're fooling themselves. You could no more love your kids while not hating the one that's abusing them. It's nonsense. Seeking does not have a willingness to harbor anything that God hates. Asa isn't just ripping down the idols of the old territory that got re-erected either. He's going after the expanded territory. He's going after all the territory, anything, everything. That's in the land and opposed to him, Ace is after it. There's not a corner of the land he's not going to leave unturned, including his own mother. Church, so often our energy is giving to safeguarding sin, justifying our sin, our protection of our sin. I think of like Gollum with his ring, his little precious, like we kind of grip it like a prized possession. But what if God's spirit gripped us and our energy wasn't spent building up our defenses, but tearing our defenses down? Tearing down sin. What if we prayed boldly? God, give me a hatred of sin. God, make sin sting. Make it hurt in my heart. I'll tell you some of the prayers that have carried with me throughout my life. God, I want to love what you love. I want to hate what you hate. And God, give me a a very sensitive conscience. Don't ever let me sear my conscience. I want to know when I have stepped out of the stream. There are people throughout history who have prayed, God makes sin nauseating to me. Literally, God, let me smell the stench that you do. What if we prayed like that because we don't want anything between us and him? If we love God so much that we hated what is opposed to him and what was against him. What if our love for God was so great we we actually hated sin? Our sin. All of it. And what if we stop believing the enemy and his lies that sin benefits? Because that's what he's always saying. What if we started believing God and his truth that sin costs always? What if we ask God for increased sensitivity to his spirit and of our spirit? What if we prayed for his power to be magnified in our life by the crushing of sin? What if we expended energy each day, putting to death, actively expending our energy and our time and our effort to the slaying of sin? So many of us assume that we seek God and that he's going to deal with sin and like just kind of leave it to him. But we actually do have a role like Asa did in tearing down those high places. Seeking looks like that. It's got this desire to remove everything that's between a hatred of sin. Do you know how we will know that revival is finally upon us? It'll start like every revival has. It will start with the sound of sniffling. And that sniffling will turn into crying. And that crying will one day turn into weeping, weeping over ways that we have pierced him. Things that have never even bothered us before, things that right now you're completely unaware that are piercing the heart of God in your life. You will suddenly say, I've got to get rid of this thing out of love for God. We'll no longer listen to a message and think about how it applies to the person across the room when revival is finally upon us. We'll feel profound agony in the harboring of anger or unforgiveness. 
Our gossip will come under godly conviction. Things our souls were at rest with before, our spirits will become suddenly struck. When that happens, you will know. And pay attention. For it's come. And these tears won't be worked up. They won't be manufactured. They will flow freely and authentically. As we, with fresh eyes, see his sinlessness, and we see our sinfulness, we will be grieved and we will be moved to repentance as we look upon that gap. How will we know that revival is upon us? Pay attention. What starts as a trickle of tears will become a raging river of repentance. It's the way every revival starts. What's the third sign of seeking Christianity? The kind that sees revival, Second Chronicles 16, 8. He then restored the altar of the Lord, which was in front of the porch of the Lord. He gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those from Ephraim, Manasseh, Simeon, who resided with them, for many defected to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. So they assembled at Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of Asa's reign. They sacrificed to the Lord that day 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep from the spoil they had brought. So what are they doing? They're restoring God's altar. They're prizing this place of sacrifice. They assemble in God's name, in God's house. They recognize God's grace, and they are tithing it back to him here. They commit to give him all, and they're shouting to the Lord loudly. In short, seekers are worshipers. Like, they don't give some in worship. They give all. You will not find them with hands stuffed in pockets. They'll be hands held high. You won't find them commanded to shout out of his victory and then praising him silently. You will not find them aware that God calls us to dance and having their feet glued to the cement. It's no accident that the great worship leader of all biblical history, the one who wrote the majority of the Psalms to the Father in our Bibles, was also the one who sought the face of God. Seekers are worshipers. And then last, 2 Chronicles 15, 12 to 15, they entered into the covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, man or woman. Moreover, they made an oath to the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting, with trumpets, and with horns. All Judah rejoiced concerning the oath, for they had sworn with their whole heart and had sought him earnestly. And he let them find him, and so the Lord gave them rest on every side. The fourth sign of seeking Christianity is a setting of the heart, okay? Like they covenanted together to seek the Lord. I mean, this is a purposed pursuit. This is not one of haphazard circumstance. They didn't say, well, I woke up this morning and just kind of wanted to, and so I did, you know, and that way it was genuine. Or what? Uh, No, they say, God, I'm coming after you. They were saying, this is one thing that we can't live without. We can't live without him. We can't live this life or have this life without him. To be without him is certain death. I mean, there's an extremity to it, but they're going after the Lord. It's why they made this covenant. Why? They kept this covenant. They had such a fear of being spiritually dead. They also knew they could coddle no complacency nor love any lukewarmness within their midst. Those who set out to climb mountains know better than to say, I'm going to climb each day if I feel like it. They purpose to the summit, and they expect to overcome obstacles to the summit. Those who seek God with a commitment and a constancy that prevails over attacks and setbacks and feelings or anything else the enemy might throw at them to get them to stop and to stall and to turn back. I'm going to tell you a story. Sunday morning, October 20th in 1996. At the Christian Tabernacle in Houston, Texas, pastored by uh, Pastor Hurd, well, revival broke out on that day. There had actually been this buildup in this congregation of like hungering for the presence of God for a couple of years at that time when revival broke. It started with the pastor himself. He got very convicted that he wasn't spending that much personal private time like in the secret place with the Lord, that all of his busyness and activity of ministry and all that was prioritizing. And so he made this radical change and, uh, to his own personal time with the Lord and, and, and God began to renew him and embers began to get lit in the congregation. Uh, as he preached from that place, it seems like the congregation started to grow in their hunger. They started to grow in their pursuit. 
By August of 1996, a pastor from Argentina, a place who had been in revival, uh, came and they conducted like a revival week, kind of like what we uh, do in the summers and uh, we will be doing again this summer. But some significant miracles happened that week. Uh, and the congregations like collective hunger just like grew uh, out of this for more of God. And then on the first weekend of October of that year, Pastor Hurd invited an evangelist named Tommy Tenney to come and preach at his church. And so Tommy Tenney comes and he, he preaches at the church and uh, God's presence was very noticeable. Tommy said it just felt like something was happening. Like you could just feel the wind stirring, um, all this sort of thing. And so actually Pastor Hurd invited him to come back the following weekend. Like, hey, would you come back? And so he actually adjusted his plans to come back because he too like knew like something's on this. Well, that Monday night in between, they ended up holding a prayer service, like unplanned. They just invited like, hey, we're going to have a prayer meeting. Well, 400 people showed up for this prayer meeting. It went for hours. That night. It was unprecedented uh, for their church. Well, the next weekend, Tommy came and it felt very similar uh, to them. Like, man, like ah, something's happening. Like God seems near. And so he was asked to come back again a third time. Third weekend of October, it was preceded by a week where the pastor actually took 30 church attenders down to Pensacola, Florida, where the famous Brownsville revival uh, was happening, which broke out the year prior. So they got back that Saturday, but here's what happened that Sunday morning. On Sunday morning, October 20th, a strong presence of God was already sensed throughout the sanctuary of Christian Tabernacle. Tinney, who's the guest speaker, said the presence of God was so strong that the air was thick, like you could hardly breathe. At times, the air was so liquid-like that it became almost unbreathable, is the way he describes it. Oxygen would come in short gasps, seemingly, and then muffled sobs. This is just at the beginning. Muffled sobs began to break through the room. Pastor Hurd asked Tinney after some time of this was going on. I mean, literally the worship leader collapsed on the stage and he had to send his wife up to keep some worship going. Um, God was like clearly moving. And so Pastor Hurd leans over to Tinney and says, hey, are you ready to take the service? Tommy Tinney says, I'm half afraid to take the service because God's about to do something. And so Pastor Hurd said, well, I feel like I have a word that I'm supposed to share. And so Tommy Tenney was actually so sure that God was about to do something. He actually got up out of the front row. He went all the way back to behind the sound booth because he wanted to see the whole room because he knew God was about to do something. He wanted to see it. So he just, he's that ready. Pastor Hurd comes up and he opens to Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, and I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. So he just reads that passage. And then Pastor Hurd tells the congregation that he felt that the Holy Spirit was speaking to him, that they were to seek God's face and not his hand. That was the word. We're supposed to seek the face of God, not the hand of God. So heard, uh, went on and he, he explained that like many people were seeking manifestations, something from God, but they're not actually seeking God himself. So he, he says these comments and then the spirit of God begins to descend upon heard and he starts to recognize it. And reportedly he like rests his hands on the table cause he was maybe afraid he was getting a little weak need. Um, but as he put his hands on this pulpit, there was a thunderclap that everyone describes, it sounded as if it was thunder that echoed throughout this worship center. Pastor Hurd said it was like someone just, and at that moment, right then, he says it was like someone just threw me across the platform. He actually shot back, his body landed nine feet away from where he was standing at the pulpit. At the same moment, the pulpit was literally split in half. So the sound of thunder, the pulpit, splits in half, he shoots back nine feet, like lightning had just struck the place. It landed in two different places, about six feet apart. You can actually see it there, kind of top and bottom. Now this split is very fascinating. It's actually people have scientifically studied this podium. 
It was not split at the seams where it was joined together. It was split across the middle. Engineers examined this pulpit. They said that pulpit, you could drop it from a 10-story building. It might shatter from such a fall, but it would not split like that. The engineers said the tensile strength of that plastic is a, is right around 114,000 pounds per square inch. Okay? Simultaneously, so this all happens, the pulpit splits apart. Simultaneously, the tangible terror of the presence of God fills this room, and the people begin to weep, and they begin to wail. Tinney then stood up because Pastor Hurd is out. He was out for two and a half hours, by the way. Tinney stands up. He's like, he'll be fine. <laughs> and he just looks at the congregation. He says, if you're not where you need to be, this is a good time to get right with God. And so Tinney describes what happens next. He says, I've never seen such an altar call. It was pure pandemonium. People shoved one another out of the way. They, w <laughs> they wouldn't wait for the aisles to clear. They climbed over pews. Businessmen tore their ties off. They were literally stacked on top of one another. It was the most horribly harmonious sound of repentance you have ever heard. Just the thought of it still sends chills down my back. From there, revival broke out. A year later, they were still seeing 30 to 40 salvations a week. It's just absolutely incredible. By the way, it's worth watching Tommy Tenney describe this day. Uh, and you can go on YouTube and you can listen to it. It's on Sid Ross's YouTube channel. Uh, I think it's called like It's Supernatural or something like this. Um, but you search Tommy Tenney and Sid Ross on YouTube. You, not YouTube, YouTube, and uh, it will come up. So I thought it was some of you might enjoy watching it. So Tenney says, to sum it all up, he said it was a rare moment where there was this very hungry pastor and a very hungry congregation, a very hungry evangelist. And he said he believes that the collective hunger of the whole determines the size of the visitation when God answers. Now, some of you might wonder, is all your hunger for God worth it? I just want to encourage you in this. Like when revival comes, it's going to be for everybody. But don't ever let that make you think it doesn't make a difference how much you seek God in the secret place or whether you don't. His outpouring is for everyone, but everyone doesn't receive the same. It is for everyone, but not everyone receives the same. On the day he pours out his spirit, some will have sought after God. Hungered after God. So think of like if your body was like a, a vessel and all this seeking, this, it's like it's being dug out, hollowed out. Some will have sought God in such a way where they're hollowed out all the way to their feet. And when God pours out his spirit, they'll be filled all the way up. All that praying, all that time in pursuit, prepare, preparing, it makes a difference. Another picture God's given is that of digging down. Like the further one goes down in their pursuit. Uh, the higher they're catapulted when God answers. Another picture to encourage you in your hungering and your pursuit of God in the secret place would be this. Imagine climbing a mountain and God has this day of visitation planned. It's a fixed destination and appointment. Every day in the secret place and in pursuit, you're like making your way there. And we've got to recognize history is full of people that miss divine intersections. They just miss these divine destinations because they failed to set their heart on seeking God. And in failing to seek God, they failed to make their way there to that point and to that place that God purposed to meet them. Think of all those that literally encountered Jesus when he was here on earth. And Jesus invited them to come and to be with him. They said, no. Imagine the man who said to him, let me first. And he missed. Oh, aren't you glad you're not him right now? We imagine that we can make these things up on the day of visitation. It's not true. Revival is for everyone, but not everyone will receive the same. Don't suppose for a second that God is not just and doesn't reward those who seek him. He does. Or that he won't be found by those that have pursued him. I think of it this way. There are some Christians who are like, man, you know what? Heaven's awesome. And no matter what, even if I barely make it, it's great. They're like content to, you know, belly crawl their way into heaven through the flames of judgment as long as they just get there. You know, it doesn't matter if they stored up any treasure or heaven, rewards, who cares? That's just the way they live. Some Christians are that way with revival too. 
It's like, well, I'm glad someone's out there seeking revival is going to come. And when it comes, I'll show up. It's like, I'm, I'm content to come once revival breaks, but they're not wanting to seek and hunger and all that. You have to understand, they're not going to have the same experience as those who seek. It's great for all. It's not the same for all. The pursuit is the path, the hunger and the pursuit. It's not wasted. The more one seeks, the more one will find. The revival of Asa. If you ask me to summarize, I say pay attention to this. The revival of Asa is a revival of if. If. He recognized the if. Second Chronicles 7.14. If. My people who are called my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and repent from sin. If. See, God hasn't changed. Let us be those who respond to God's invitation. If. His promises are as true today as they were then. Listen, we're going to close with a time of worship and seeking. My prayer for us is that we will be one like Asa that recognizes and believes God and responds. And so I'm going to invite us to pray together. And God, as we pray, we pray, Lord, for a sustained steadfastness as we seek you. God, we are praying that you would ignite and that you would light the fires of pursuit and of passion in our hearts. We recognize you can do that. God, would you light the fires of pursuit and passion in our hearts? If you're here and you're one who's desperate for God to make you desperate, I'd, I'd encourage you to get to the altar. For all of us, let's seek you. Amen.
congregation, if we pour our hearts out in repentance and set ourselves right before the Lord, if we humble ourselves, His Holy Spirit will come like a rushing wind. So I think that maybe we need to take a minute or a while and pour our hearts out. Little things, big things, whatever it is that's between you and the Lord, I ask that you guys might consider repenting, bowing before the Lord in your hearts, physically, whatever it is, that we would repent and the Holy Spirit would meet us in power.
say in a situation like this, this is a soft dismissal, but what I want to say is I urge you to stay. And if you desire, if you, if you want more, the altars are open. Um, students, stay where you are. Um, but if any of you would, would like to receive prayer from uh, Shane or Rebecca, one of our elders, just lift your hand. They would love to pray for you. I'm going to just stay right where you are. And again, if you want to receive more, if you're hungry, if you're thirsty, I invite you to come to the altar and come and ask. Father, we thank you for your presence tonight.
feeling led uh, in this moment. Some of you guys got kids in the room. Um, I don't know where Kevin and Brian are. There's Kevin and Brian. Um, I think we should pray for your kids tonight. So we got prayer teams in the back here, too. I mean, we got your teenagers up here, but all the kids. So if, if you want your kids to receive prayer, that they would grow to be Josh and I and Caleb's. Uh, we got some folks in the back there. We'll pray with you. Brian and Kevin.
We thank you, Father. Thank you, Son. Thank you, Spirit. Thank you.